So will you pray with me this morning? <clears throat> Lord God, we thank you and we praise you this morning. We give you all of the glory as we come here to worship you this morning. And Lord, we know that you are present in our midst. So Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will move powerfully among us, that you would open our eyes and ears and hearts to what you want us to hear from your word today. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So when I say Jonah, what do you automatically think of? The, yes, the whale, the big fish. You might also think of Jonah, who was disobedient. He tends to be depicted front and center. This is a story that we hear from when we are very young. It's painted on the walls of our nurseries and our Sunday school classrooms. It is in the children's Bibles with all of the happy faces and Jonah smiling and the whale smiling. I think that I probably did not even crack the book of Jonah open when I was in seminary. It's just not, a, it's not somewhere that we usually go. But recently, I have become reacquainted with Jonah and have started studying it again. And there is so much here. It is such a rich book with profound, simple but profound truths. So I wanted to just look at the first chapter today, and I would encourage you, Again, because we know the story, because we've heard it preached on before, I would still encourage you to go back and read the book of Jonah. It's only four chapters. But we're going to start here in chapter one, because I've really been struck with some of the, the truths lately here in Jonah. So we think a lot of Jonah as the main character of the story, don't we? But if we really look at it, what, what do we know about Jonah? We really don't know a whole lot. We read this morning, it just starts out with, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. We jump right in there. He's mentioned in 2 Kings 14.25, King Jeroboam restored the border of Israel from the entrance of Hamath as far as the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, which he spoke through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was of gath Hefer. So we know some basics about Jonah. We know where he's from. We know who his father is. We don't know anything else about his family. We know his current occupation, that he is a prophet. The word of the Lord came to him. So then that goes hand in hand with the fact that we know that he has a relationship with God. We know that he is well off, that he could up and leave his family, his people, and hire a ship to take him to Tarshish. He must have had some means. And then we know from the story that Jonah hears the message but chooses to disobey at first. So we really don't know anything other than that about Jonah. And I believe that this is completely significant because we see that Jonah is really not the main character of the story, believe it or not. That the fish is not the main character of the story. It is God who is 
the main character in the book of Jonah. Here in Jonah 1, we hear, we learn that God is sovereign. And what's very interesting is, especially because Jonah fled, he did not want to obey God, but he also doesn't have any of the credentials. He's not some important man. He's not necessarily more equipped for the job. And then he flees on top of it, yet God still uses Jonah. He could have chosen anyone else, but he uses Jonah. So we see here right from the get-go that God is sovereign. And if we look at the entire book of Jonah, we see Jonah 1.1 begins with the word of the Lord. The very last verse of the Bible, of, of the book of Jonah, is the word of the Lord, and then everything in between. So God is sovereign. If we look at Jonah 2, we will see that God is our deliverer. He provides the whale to swallow Jonah. And then after some time of reflect, reflection and prayer, the big fish spits Jonah out onto the shore. God is our deliverer. Jonah 3, God is merciful. Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, when God saw that the Ninevites had turned from their evil ways, he had compassion on them. So God is merciful. And then the fourth chapter, we see that God is righteous. He has that great conversation with Jonah, where Jonah is still angry that God would have saved the people, the evil people of Nineveh. And God said, hey, you know, I am a righteous God. I am not just for you, Israel. So God is righteous. So as I'm thinking about this, this aha moment that God is the one who is front and center, not Jonah, not the fish, it caused me to start to ask some questions of myself. And the first, again, a very basic question, but one that we can lose sight of so easily, is God front and center in my life? Is he, does he have the, the starring role? Or have I relegated him to best supporting actor? Or I don't know if you remember, I saw a while back, there was a bumper sticker, God is my co-pilot. I saw that quite often. God is my co-pilot. And then shortly after that, I saw a bumper sticker that said, in answer to that, if God is your co-pilot, then switch seats. Or if God is your co-pilot, move over. Because really, we don't want God to be our co-pilot. We want him to be the pilot. We want him to be our sovereign God. And we so easily get confused. It happened from the beginning of time in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve wanted that knowledge. They wanted to be like God. The Tower of Babel. Abraham wanting to kind of speed God up a little bit. God said, you're going to be the father of all nations, yet Abraham didn't see it coming fast enough, so he took matters into his own hands. Again and again and again we become confused. But there is only one God, and I am not him. You are not him. So is he front and center in our lives? And if he is... What that means is, have we consulted him in all manners, matters? Have we gone to his word? Have we studied his word to see how it is that he wants us to live? 
Have we taken time out of our busy schedules to spend time in prayer, in conversation with him, listening to him? So is he front and center? And if God is front and center in our lives, and if we are spending time with him, consulting him, hearing from him, will I be obedient? Because we all have Jonah in us. We really do. The word of the Lord comes to each of us, and very unfortunately, sometimes we run the other way. We don't want to, we either don't want to hear him, we try to flee from his presence, or we hear from him and we're just really not interested in doing what he wants us to do. So have I actually relinquished control and will I be obedient to him? That's uncomfortable sometimes, that's scary, as we see from Jonah. The last place that Jonah wanted to go was Nineveh. And to be quite honest with you, I do not blame him. Nineveh was an awful place. It was violent. It was hateful. They hated the Hebrew people. And I had heard it compared to, and I think it's very much like our modern-day ISIS. They were an evil, evil people. And think about how you would feel if God called you to go speak the word of the Lord to the people of ISIS. I don't think that we would be running to that calling. So there are times where God calls us to do things that are very unpleasant. A lot of the times, he calls us to do things that are challenging. But will he be obedient? Well, interestingly enough, God gets Jonah. And Jonah tries to be disobedient, but God gets him back, and he eventually does what God has called him to do. It made me think of a man that I had the privilege of getting to know right here in Kansas City. His name is Tass Saida, a, a truly remarkable man who has a remarkable story. He has a book out called Once an Arafat Man. When he was young, he was raised as a Palestinian on the Gaza Strip. And like many of the young men, he fell into a group and just started to become filled with hatred. Filled with hatred for the Jews, filled with hatred for people in general. And he went off and he became a PLO sniper and actually killed many Jews. He killed Christians. He killed many people. Well, his parents, while they were strict Muslims, they were not in favor of him being part of Fatah, and they were able to extricate him from that situation. And his dad took his passport away and said, I'll give this back when you decide to go back to school. And you may go either to Saudi Arabia, you may go to England. And Tass said, no, I want to go to the United States. And his dad said, okay, well, anything just to get you out of here. Because Tass was still such an angry person, unpleasant person. So Tass ended up coming to the United States back in 1973 to start to get an education. And um, he began to work in a restaurant in Kansas City. And he started out just as a dishwasher and busboy. But pretty soon, he worked his way up to be waiter and eventually manager. And he was in that position for about 20 years. Well, that very first year that he worked in that restaurant, a man named Charlie came in. 
And when Tass cle cleared off Charlie's table, Charlie said, thank you so much for doing this. And that quickly got Tass's attention because people where he was from, they did not thank you for doing the menial labor. So he made a decision at that point that whenever Charlie came into the restaurant, he would serve him. And so thus began a 20-year relationship with Charlie. And Tass would tell you now in his testimony that from that very first day, God started working on him and started working in his life. Now, he didn't know it at first, but there was an uneasiness in him. Well, finally, as God was working on him, working on him through Charlie, one day, 20 years later, he started to have these anxiety attacks. So he immediately got on the phone, and he called Charlie and said, I'm losing it. And Charlie said, I'll be right there. I'll pick you up. So Charlie went, picked him up, took him to his house, and for the very first time, opened up the scriptures. And for the very first time, Tass was able to receive that. Instead of saying, no, I don't want to hear it, leave me alone. And so he heard from John 1. And at that point in time, he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And he realized that after all those years, God was pursuing him and eventually called him to go back to the Gaza Strip to be a missionary. So that's where he and his wife ministered. It was very dangerous. There were people in his own family that were trying to kill him. There were people on the Gaza Strip who had it out for him. But God had a calling that he had placed on Taz's life. A remarkable, remarkable story. So sometimes it would take 20 years. Sometimes, hopefully, it's a lot shorter than that. But when we are walking with God, when we hear his calling on our lives, and that can come in any a, a number of ways. We always want to hear that loud, audible voice telling us what to do, maybe a text or an email. We want to hear that loud voice, but sometimes it's that still, small voice where God comes and calls us. Sometimes it's through other people. I have an excellent spiritual director who we get together once a month, and she asks me pointed questions to help me see where God is in my life, what he is saying to me. So if we are spending time with him, if we are hearing him, will we be obedient to that calling? So then that begs the last question. If I am Jonah, as so many of us are, and we are being called, where is my Nineveh? Do we have a Nineveh? Is God calling us someplace where we may not want to go? I think sometimes we are under the impression that when we're walking with Jesus, life will be all smooth and rosy and his demands of us will be easy. But that's not the case, as we see from Jonah and from countless other stories in the Bible. God will challenge us. God will take us out of our comfort zone. And being obedient to him, arising and going, as he calls Jonah to do, can be a very daunting thing and can, can be very challenging. So where is it that God is calling you? I'm giving my true confessions here as we think about where is my Nineveh. Um, I became chaplain at Covenant Place of Lenexa. It is a graduated care um, retirement community. And I became chaplain there just in June. And one of my coworkers, who is not a believer, 
I think, decided very early on that she did not like me, just by very virtue of the fact that I was a Christian and the chaplain, and so we've had a very interesting relationship. But I felt very strongly several weeks ago that God was saying, you know what, Elise, you really need to invite her out to lunch and you need to start that conversation. Well, here it is about a month later, and I have yet to ask her to lunch. And I have people praying for me, and I have people holding me accountable. But I think that is, in a small way, my Nineveh. So it doesn't have to be a large city. It could be right here with my neighbor. So is God front and center in your life? What is he asking of you? And will you be obedient to his calling? And as we think about those questions, I just want to leave us with the reminder that God is a God of grace. And we see that about him in the book of Jonah. I mean, he provided that fish for Jonah, which was an act of grace. Jonah did not drown, but he was swallowed up. He was able to regroup. And then God was with Jonah. And God is with us, giving us the ability, giving us the grace to step out in faith. So as you think about these things, as you think about these questions, just keep in mind that God is with us. Will you pray with me?